Our passage this morning is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 16, verses 18 through 20. And I would ask you to please remain seated as we hear God's word. Moses writes, verse 18, You shall appoint judges and officers in all your towns that the Lord your God is giving you, according to your tribes, and they shall judge the people with righteous judgment. You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality. And you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. Justice, and only justice, you shall follow, that you may live and inherit the land that the Lord your God is giving you. Here's an interesting Google search. Top news headlines for 2018. It's striking to see how many stories have to do with the topic of justice. Here are a few examples from among the most popular headlines. Kevin Spacey attends court on assault charges. Georgia police used taser to stun 87-year-old grandmother. She must have been very intimidating. Bill Cosby is sentenced to upwards of 10 years in prison. Pakistan frees Christian woman from death sentence. Looters target Florida homes left in dark after Hurricane Michael. Now, in some cases, it seems as though justice has been served. But in other instances, well, it's just not clear. The vagaries of deception cloud and confuse a case. Confusion that makes us long for the day, quite frankly, when Jesus, the Son of Righteousness, will return and make all things right. When the light of God will finally pierce the clouds of human lies and treachery. In the meantime, we all wonder, how does one realize divine justice in this life, here and now, true righteousness that protects the innocent and punishes the guilty? Well, the answer may come as a surprise to you. The answer is the church. Scripture teaches that God gives divine righteousness to his people so that we would showcase, we would display in very practical ways the way that we live from day to day what it is to be people of righteousness. One place where this comes into sharp focus is the book of Deuteronomy. It was from the plain of Moab just outside of the land where Moses offered this insight, explaining how God's people live lives of justice. So chapter 11 in verse one says, you shall therefore love the Lord your God and keep his statutes. This is central because Israel belongs to God. They're his people. He drew them to himself and established with them this formal relationship called a covenant And God says rather clearly in Deuteronomy 28 through 32 that when you obey me, you'll be blessed. Life will be good for you. You'll be full of justice. When you disobey, then life will unwind. And so follow these statutes so that you can shine forth with God's character. That's the burden of Deuteronomy. One way scripture describes this calling is with the language of justice or righteousness. I'll use these words interchangeably because they are translations of the same root word in Hebrew, tzedek. Now, unfortunately, these words, righteousness and justice, are rather arid and dusty sounding. It's difficult to say them without sounding as though you were speaking through a stained glass window. And that's really too bad because these words describe some of the most sublime and glorious truths in all the universe because they ultimately describe God. Here's an example from Deuteronomy. Chapter 32 and verse four says, 
The Lord is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are justice. A God of faithfulness and without iniquity, just and upright is he. There's only one being in all of the universe about whom this could be said, and it's God. He's completely just. He abides in unapproachable light. He is majestic in holiness. This is what we considered during Advent when we looked at Isaiah 6. It is the Lord who is high and lifted up, and it is around his throne that the angels sing holy, 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 and he is at the very center of the universe. Perspective on God's justice highlights the great contrast between God and man. So Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 20 says, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. Now we understand this, right? We regularly succumb to the gravitational pull of sin. We live in the shadow lands. But God beckons us to step out from the shadows and to walk before him in righteousness. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what the Lord requires of you, but to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with your God. So what does it look like to showcase this kind of justice? Well, following the lengthy section that deals with Israel's worship comes this brief passage on the character of Israel's leaders. God appoints them to promote justice among individuals and families. We think of Deuteronomy 6, Hear, O Israel, the Lord thy God, the Lord is one. In the course of living, you are to fashion your family life in such a way that you reflect God's loving kindness. And it's true also for the community, for the nation overall. This was the heart of Israel's calling. It's the reason why God planted her in the land right there in the cross section of east and west so that when ancient peoples traveled, they would recognize God's people are living in a way that is different, in a way that reflects righteousness. Verse 18. It's possible the judges here appointed were leaders of local council of elders. Chapter, verse, uh, chapter 19 and verse 12 seems to make this point. And then the second group designated here, officers or officials, are thought to be administrative assistants charged with carrying out the policies of justice in various communities. What was the priority of their job description. Verse 20 makes it clear. Justice and only justice you shall follow. In other words, pure justice, that is the standard by which you are to govern and live. Now, given what we've noted about this word, tzedek in Hebrew, Moses is saying, in effect, the Lord's character is to be your standard. His holiness, his integrity. This is how you are to live life. The word inherit in verse 20 is perhaps not the best translation. A better rendering, I think, would be take possession of. It's an active word. It describes a top priority to which you give yourself. So let this justice and the manifestation of it in your life be the priority that animates you. That's what Moses is saying. It was true for Israel's leaders. It was true for the nation. And my friends, it is true for us. We whose lives are grounded in the righteous one. This is our calling. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 24, Paul says, Put on the new self, created after the likeness of God, in true righteousness and holiness. So we think of chapter 6 where the apostle tells us, put on the breastplate of righteousness. So identify with that quality of God that wherever you go, it, it, it goes before you. So very practically then, how do we live lives of righteousness? Well, nestled between these two statements is verse 19. Verse 19 provides the crucial ways 
that we can embody justice in the world. Here they are. I'll read the verse for us. Number one, you shall not pervert justice. Number two, you shall not show partiality. And number three, you shall not accept a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and subverts the cause of the righteous. We'll take each in turn three ways we embody divine justice so the world would recognize God's majesty. First, verse 19a, we shall not pervert justice. From the very start, there is a problem. The human heart specializes in perverting justice. The word pervert in Hebrew, nata, conveys the idea of turning aside, bending, or deviating from that which is true. Exhibit A, the golden calf. God has liberated his people from the bondage of Egypt. He's brought them to himself, and now he is about to commission them. Moses has called up the mountain. God is giving his word, and what are the people doing? They're taking off their earrings and jewelry, melting it down, and crafting a golden calf before which they will bow in worship. This is what the human heart does. John Calvin has said that human hearts are idol-producing factories. We just pump them out one after another. Well, this is what perversion looks like. We either lower God to our level, failing to take seriously holiness and purity and divine perfection, or we make God so transcendent that we lose sight of his mercy and his grace. It's so easy for us, isn't it, to fall off of one side of the horse or the other. Here's an example from Deuteronomy 25. Verse 1 says, when people have a dispute, they are to take it to the court and the judges will decide the case, acquitting the innocent and condemning the guilty. If the guilty person deserves to be beaten, the judge shall make them lie down and have them flogged in his presence with the number of lashes the crime deserves. So this is the standard of justice, right? This is Nahum chapter one and verse three, where it says the Lord will not let the guilty go unpunished. But Moses continues and notice what he goes on to say in verse three. But the judge must not impose more than 40 lashes. If the guilty party is flogged more than that, your fellow Israelite will be degraded in your eyes. That, my friends, is mercy. The righteousness of God always includes this quality of mercy. We see it throughout the Old and New Testament. Here are just a few examples from the Hebrew scriptures, Psalm 98 and verse two. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. Isaiah 30, verse 18. Therefore the Lord longs to be gracious to you and he waits on high to have compassion on you. The Lord is a God of justice. Not the word you were perhaps expecting to hear. Psalm 89. And verse 14, once again, notice how holiness and mercy go hand in hand. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of your throne. Love and faithfulness go before you. A poignant example of this from Moses' life is when he asked to see God's glory. Remember that? It wasn't too long ago we considered this. Lord, may I see your glory? Well, Moses, no man can look directly upon God and live But I'll tell you what, I will pass by, said the Lord, and you will stand here in the cleft of the rock, and as I do, I will allow you to behold the afterglow of my splendor. And so there is Moses, and he gets to see the brilliance of God after the Lord has passed by. But as the Lord's passing, as you know, the Lord is declaring who he is, and what does he say? Right? Of all the things God could say, he could say, I'm, I'm holy, I'm sovereign, I'm just. He said, I am the Lord, the Lord, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That's what God chose to say about himself. See 
from his head, his hands, his feet. Sorrow and love flow mingled down. Did e'er such love and sorrow meet, or thorns compose so rich a crown? He is the king, the sovereign, who wears a crown of thorns. So how do our perverted hearts grasp this truth? Here's how. By recognizing how the God of justice first reaches out to grasp us, not as a domineering judge, not as a feeble Galilean, but as a crucified God. In Paul's words, he is the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. That, says Paul, is the way God demonstrates his righteousness at the present time, Romans 3. We therefore reverence God because he's holy. We rightly fear him. We recognize that he is high and lifted up. He is God. And at the same time, we rest in his grace because he is the God who saves. I love the way Teresa of Lesu has put it as she considers appearing before God Almighty, the judge of the living and the dead. Here is what she says. Quote, in the evening of this life, I shall appear before you with empty hands, for I do not ask you, Lord, to count my works. All our justice is blemished in your eyes. I wish then instead to be clothed in your own justice, to receive from your love the eternal possession of yourself. How lovely. To recognize this blessed pairing, holiness and mercy, is the first step toward showcasing divine righteousness in the world. And that leads to our second insight, verse 19b. We shall show no partiality. Literally, you shall not recognize faces in a way that allows favoritism to influence judicial decisions. Now, why is this an issue? Well, it's simply another way that we so easily fall into the idolatry trap. Rather than being delighted by divine righteousness, we find delight in the praise of other people. Can anyone relate to this? It's no accident that the New Testament addresses this point explicitly. Some of you have already gone here. Uh, you've thought of this text in James chapter 2, right, where, the, where it's written, my brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. For if a man wearing a gold ring and fine clothing comes into your assembly, and a poor man in shabby clothing also comes in, and if you pay attention to the one who wears the fine clothing, and you say, you sit here in a good place, while you say to the poor man, you stand over there or sit at my feet, have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? It's so natural. We love the praise of man instead of God. A great treatment of this is found in Augustine's great work, The City of God. There, you may know, he delineates two different cities that are marked by different loves. The first, the city of God, consists of free citizens who've been liberated from sin in order to love and to worship God. The second city, the city of man, is a place of slavery bondage to pride and the desire of self-praise, right, to accumulate as much of our own glory as we can. About this, Augustine writes, what is pride but the craving for undue exaltation? And this is undue exaltation, when the soul abandons him to whom it ought to cleave. Underneath favoritism, is the idolatry of pride and prestige, and oh, how much we love it. But there's good news. Christ sets us free from this bondage. 
Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1. For freedom Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. See, this is the good news, that as justified children of God, as men and women whose lives are established in Christ, we are already accepted. We're accepted by God himself, the one who matters the most. Because we are accepted by God, we are then motivated to extend that same quality of love to other people. We become a conduit of his grace. Galatians 5.13, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. How much do you love other people? How much of God's love do you possess? Well, simply ask this question. How are you getting along with others? How are you extending the kindness and the patience and the blessing of God to other people? Because the amount of love that we give others indicates the love that we have received from God. Mark 12, 31, love God above all, right? That's the greatest commandment. And the second commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. We receive this love from, from God, see? And then there's an overflow that extends to other people. The two go hand in hand. And so I'm suggesting to you that bondage and fear of what other people think about us. When we, we, we live in this craven fear of our own reputation is a symptom of a deeper problem, an inability to embrace the acceptance of God. Listen to how Amy Carmichael puts it. If the praise of others elates me, if the blame of others depresses me, if I cannot rest when I am misunderstood without defending myself, if I love to be loved more than to give love, if I love to be served more than serving, then I know nothing of Calvary love. Yes, we live in the city of man, but in Christ, we are citizens of the city of God. Finally, our third point, verse 19c. What does it look like for us to showcase divine justice in the world? We shall not manipulate. Moses says, you shall not accept a bribe, for a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and literally twists the words of the righteous. Bribery is singled out as the worst form of judicial corruption because it makes one blind. Even the wise person becomes foolish and uninformed. And it also twists one's words. Honest men and women become deceptive and manipulative when they're involved in bribery. Now, we're acquainted with how this works. This is the city of man. This is where we live. It's interesting to consider how such bribery and manipulation was central to the paganism of the ancient world. Pagans imagined gods to have human qualities, passion, jealousy, pride, spite, vengeance. And whenever the gods were thought to be insulted or angry, supplicants were to appease them with gifts and prayers. We see this throughout the ancient world in Egypt, Mediterranean coast, into the Fertile Crescent. Religious experience was consistently given to the appeasement of deities. This is perhaps best illustrated in the temples, sanctuaries, and areas of animal sacrifice that were located on mountaintops throughout antiquity. Consistently, we find places of pagan worship on the tops of mountains, and where the topography was flat, the ancient people would dig into the earth and construct artificial hills 
from which they would reach out to these gods. Why? Well, the reason is because they had to provide food for the deity. See, these pagan gods were thought to be powerful in all sorts of ways, but the one thing they could not do for themselves was eat. They relied on people to bring animal sacrifice, which was thought in the pagan mind to be food for the gods. And so people had something on the gods, right? Gods needed them in order to eat. And so the image is of the worshiper reaching toward heaven, working feverishly to placate the gods, to appease them, satisfy them, to make them happy, and somehow, some way, earn their favor. See what's going on here? This is the inner logic of a bribe. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. It's all quid pro quo. It's all about manipulation. So I wonder, have you ever approached God in this way? Can I make a confession to you? I do this more than I care to admit. I'm not climbing mountains to pour out libations or offering animal sacrifice, but I do attempt to justify myself. I try to impress God. I try to bend God to my will instead of bending my knee to his. I forget the truth of 1 Samuel 15, that to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen is better than the fat of rams. But you say, Chris, this isn't about giving a bribe. Our text is about receiving bribes. But here again, I think the, the two really go hand in hand. To take a bribe indicates that one has misunderstood God's gracious character, his acceptance, his love. That one hasn't received for him or herself redemptive mercy. That's why they are involved in bribery. So how do we avoid this? What must we know to avoid this trap? Not just of bribery, but of manipulation in general. Simply this. Unlike pagan deities, God doesn't need us. You realize that. He owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He is the self-existent one who does not need us. But he chooses on account of his great love to enter into our world and to draw near to us in a most personal way. He chooses to count the hairs on our head, to number each of them, and to understand the intimate concerns of our heart because that's the God he is as the God of justice. He is the God who comes to us. He comes to us in grace and he feeds us. We don't feed God, but he feeds our souls, and he does it in a way that meets our personal needs perfectly. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy, and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Incline your ear and come to me here, so that you may live, Isaiah 55. So this morning I want to ask the simple question, my friends, are you feasting on God's Son? We so easily spend our time and our resources on that which is not bread. We invest ourselves in ephemeral pursuits that do not truly satisfy. Let us recognize that in a world that is bereft of justice, God has given us the gift of himself. He has grounded us in the righteousness of his son. And our great privilege as men and women and young people who belong to Christ is to walk before him in righteousness, to take this reality of who he is and to show the watching world. A righteousness that is both holy and merciful. A righteousness that liberates us from the bondage of self-praise righteousness that is full of grace and is therefore incorruptible. Let us pray.
Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you that in the gospel, the righteousness of God has been revealed from faith for faith. As it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. Would you help us, please, to be individuals whose lives are established in your righteousness, not our own. Help us to be families that cultivate this righteousness. Help us to be a church that shines forth in righteousness, that all would see and would know that Jesus Christ is King. Amen.